Okay, we have this quiz based on the assignment we're do today in miles and math. We don't like three people attempting and putting that assignment off. It'll be due along with the next assignment on Thursday. Okay, on uh, Wednesday night. So be sure you get it done. You might have to go, you probably have to go to the half credit page. But if you go to the half credit page and do it, I'll transfer it over for full credit this time. Okay. Otherwise, in these assignments, you start with half credit. If you always get half credit, it's going to end up costing you about half a level. Okay. So we want to get them done on time. If occasionally you got to do one for half credit, it's probably not going to make a huge difference. Unless you're really, really close to the borderline and just can't make a decision whether to give you the higher or the lower grade. And I look back and say, oh, look at all that happened. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, anyhow. This is covered nicely on this side. So be sure you understand it. Now, you should understand it based on what we've done previously. Let me just give you an example of what we've done previously. F of X equals 2 to the X. Then F of X minus H equals 2 to the X minus H. And I've written this down for all the toolkit functions. Now, you also, the assignment also gives you all the toolkit functions, but it does it and even allows you to use a calculator, which I don't because you need to construct it. Okay. And I think people are making good progress in constructing. I mean, hopefully, if I quizzed you today and gave you a 30 point quiz to do them in two minutes, more than one person would pass. Well, actually, a couple of people passed this time. One person got them all right. Okay. Anyhow, so you you got to you got to do that. this. This all relates back to that picture, and we need to picture the toolkit functions in an arbitrary box. Okay. So anyhow, covered this. Talked about this at least twice in two different days. Okay, and referred to it probably on the third. Okay. Well, the pattern is if I. If f of x equals 2 to the x, then f x minus h better be 2 to the x minus h. Because this is a rule that tells you what happens to what's in the parentheses. It becomes the exponent with 2 as a base. Okay? If you just look at it literally, if you replace x by x minus h, then you have to replace every x here by x minus h. That's it. That's all you got to know. I mean, there's a lot more you got to know, but to answer these questions, that's all you got to know. What does it mean? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit too after you've done the assignment. The open math is going to tell you. With some pretty good videos. I don't like their use of calculator and decimals for doing the full kit functions. And I disagree. Partly because people don't know how to do the arithmetic. They don't want you doing arithmetic that you can't do using your calculator. Okay. That's all arithmetic that you can easily do without a calculator, and they use a calculator. I object. I disagree. I don't object so much because I'm pretty good, but I disagree. Make sure you understand what I'm saying. Okay, so if f of x equals x squared, then f of 3 equals 3 squared. Now, if you want to say it's nine, that's okay. I know it's squared three, but I don't do that. I just replace x with whatever's in parentheses and write it out. And then if I want to calculate it, say three squared is nine, terribly much. Okay. And if that's useful to me, I'll do that. Okay. But I'm just going to leave it at this. The rest is easy. Now, f of five minus f of two. What's f of five? It's five squared. Because f of x is still x squared. So f of five is five squared. f of two is two squared. So f of five 
minus alpha two equals five squared minus one squared. You calculate it, it's 21. I think I saw it 21 somebody's pen. Okay. So you know that's that's good. You know, to uh, be get them all. This will be a go and give you a point. If you got at least a couple of them, you give you two points. You get the full three points, you gotta get them all right. Okay. Or at least maybe a very minor mistake. Okay. Well, then what's f of five minus f of two over five minus two? Now let's back up a second. People want to subtract the two from the five. There's no five minus two in this. F is in the way. F says do this. If you subtract, do five minus two, you're going to get three, you're going to get nine, you're not going to get five squared minus two squared, which is 24. So don't do that. Okay? It doesn't work that way. It's like you're trying to use a distributive law. And there's no distributive law. Okay. It has to be a linear function, and then the distributive law would work, but only if it's a linear function. And most functions aren't linear, and the ones that are we're going to deal with in this class, even though we will spend a week or so on linear functions soon, next week probably. Um, most of what we study here is not linear, and I don't even think we should have to cover linear functions because you shouldn't have had it in a way. But beyond the reality, we have it, so or most of you have it. So, okay, now f of 5 minus f of 2 then is 5 squared minus 2 squared because f of 5 is 5 squared. f of 2 is 2 squared. We can use it, you know. And that's over 5 minus 2. And of course, if you want to work that out, that's 21 over 3 with your 7. Okay. Not hard. Nothing hard about this, except making yourself do it with literal substitution. Okay. I hope I wasn't blocking the board too much there. I'm looking over here. Um, so let's do L of X plus L to F. Now F of x equals x squared. What's f of x plus delta x? Write down on your paper what you think f of x plus delta x is. And be as literal as you can in what you write down. Don't make any assumptions. Um, and a little trouble seeing this. Let me write a little bit of it. It's really important. Remember, you're always welcome to sit close. Okay. Room. Nobody wants to get close to me. I understand that completely. Okay. Now, uh, it's L of X plus delta X. What's that equal? Well, that's the square of whatever's in here. You got to square this. And that's x plus delta x squared. That's what it is. If you write x squared plus delta x squared, it's wrong. But it's the right idea. You're just disrespecting the distributive law, and you're not writing it literally. So if you wrote x squared plus delta x squared, OK, for now. But don't do the Okay. Now, what's that? Just to be sure you understand why it's not what a lot of people want to write. It's x plus delta x multiplied by x plus delta x. You can't argue with this. Oh, you can, but you're not going to win. <laughs> okay. That's what it means to square something. You multiply it by itself. And that equals by the distributive law x multiplied by x plus delta x plus delta x. 
multiplied by x plus delta x. Because when you have this plus this times something else, that means you multiply this by something else and add what you get when you multiply this by something else. That's a distributive law of multiplication over addition. And people screw that up regularly, no matter how much I preach against it. <laughs> okay. Anyhow, it comes out like this. And you should try to understand this. We'll talk about it more in detail, but it's not something we can do a lot of because we can't teach you the algebra that you need in order to do this. We can just refer to it and expect you to go to tutoring, get on the internet, and make sure your algebra is up to the course. You're all smart. You can do this. Okay. Anyhow, it's x times x plus delta x, which is x times x plus x times delta x plus delta x times x plus delta x times delta x. Because x times x plus x times delta x, and then we add delta x times x, and then delta x times delta x. It's very simple. That's a distributive law. If that doesn't make sense to you, you're going to need to upgrade your health system, but it's not all that difficult. It's a little practice. Okay. So this is x squared. Now, x times delta x is the same as delta x times x. So it doesn't matter in what order you do your multiplication. So you got two x delta x's. And then you have the square of delta x. Now, if you write it this way, you're not quite right. Because you're not squaring x, you're squaring delta x, and you need the parentheses there if you're going to square the delta x and not just the x. So you should probably review this to make sure it really makes sense because I'm going to go on. Okay? It's not the primary thing I'm trying to do, but I'm warning you about the distributive law. You have to understand it. Okay. Then, f of x plus delta x minus f of x is x plus delta x squared minus well, f of x is just x squared, there it is. And this then equals x squared plus 2x delta x plus the square of delta x, not delta x squared, which is a different thing. And then minus x squared. So think of this from here, and we just count it down here. There it is. We work it out. We don't have to work it out twice. Well, it wouldn't bring some practice. Okay. Now, somebody want to tell me how this simplifies a little bit? I did comment on the usefulness of understanding why things work and on the fact that people were cancer, which is something you're taught to do long enough to pass an SOL so the school can get funding and then forget. And that totally ruins undergraduate education secondary education in Virginia. Other states have their own creative ways of learning, but they also manage. <laughs> okay. Some much better than Virginia does. Uh, and uh, uh, it forces teachers into a mode where they can't teach you how to think. They just teach you how to cross things out. And you do it wrong. And people will try to cancel this actually fits that. So ignorant stuff. And ignorant because it's not, it's taught in an ignorant manner. Ignorant means you don't know. Ignorant doesn't mean you're stupid. Now, the design of the SOL is stupid <laughs> with the two O's, S T O O P I D, with an exclamation point. Okay, I'm off my soapbox, I hope. 
You got x squared and you got negative x squared. This is x squared minus x squared plus 2x delta x plus delta x squared because, and there's several rules that allow you to rearrange this, but you know you can do that. When you've got a bunch of terms added together, and including negative terms like this, you can change the order. We can do that with the community, even if we don't totally understand how the commutative and associative laws go together to make that happen. Okay, and that's too much. Yeah, that's too abstract. So we do save that for more rigorous courses. But x minus x squared is zero. So you don't have to write it out, and there it is. Now, there's one more expression that's very important. The most important expression you're going to see in your pre-calculus course, if we're really teaching pre-calculus, not algebra. It's not this course. We've seen algebra, but of course, I know that I can't see it. But I'll tell you what to review and what to know. Okay, 2x delta. Okay, so here's... This is called the difference equation. It's the foundation of calculus. And it has an interpretation that we'll see soon. Okay. If we do this, same expression here, but divide by delta x, this then equals 2x delta x plus the square of delta x all divided by this. There's a distributive law here as well because you're multiplying this by the reciprocal of delta x. So like one over x multiplied by all of this. Now, if I had a little more room, I'd write out the intermediate step. But the delta x divides this, so delta x divides delta x, leaving you 2x. Delta x also divides the square of delta x, leaving you just the delta x. And I'm going to even write a little more, and you might pick it up, but we'll talk about it more in detail. If you let delta x shrink to zero, what are you left with? 2x, right? Now we say that this term approaches 2x as delta x approaches zero. Right here is your first three weeks of calculus. But you do a little bit more with it. But that's a foundation. It's also the average rate of change of this function and we talked about average rate of change and fundamental triangles. So we're going to see all that probably later this week. That's all I'm going to say about it now. This works no matter how you define the function. Now, when I say this works, I don't mean that all the details. If, if the function is uh, uh, 1 over x, then you're not going to be squaring anything, so you're not going to have to worry about the distributive law, right? And then you're going to have to kind of stand on your head and do some algebra that I'm not going to ask you to do, but you'll have to do in calculus and then talk rigorously. Maybe, maybe not if it's applied calculus. Okay. But this one's easy to understand. Okay. So my point is for different function, the details of working it out will be different. But this is still going to give you at that average rate of change. And if you let the delta x approach zero, it gives you the instantaneous rate of change. That's all I'm going to say. It's the third time I've said that's all I'm going to say, but that is all I'm going to say right now. Let's say more next time. Okay, so there we have it. There's function notation. Well, that's the biggest hurdle 
in the section 1.1 assignment. So make sure you understand it when you see it in the assignment. And if you're getting the right answers on the problems and not haven't seen this, then you probably ought to think about doing the problems more independently without watching the videos as you do the problem. Like watch the video, put it away, try the problem. You get stuck, okay. Flip through the video until you find the part you missed, fix it, put the video away, and redo it. That's how you learn. Okay? You don't learn by just imitating, okay, this is supposed to go there, so I guess this is supposed to go here. So you get the whole idea. And the idea is not difficult. The idea is just whatever's in here replaces X everywhere. That's it. That's all I'm going to say about that, except every time I do it, I'm not going to explain it. Make sure you understand. I think you will. But if you did the assignment and couldn't do the quiz today, do it again for practice without looking at anything. Okay? Make sure you can just get through that assignment in no time. Well, there are many other things. I mentioned a couple of them. This graph of the function. How do you know if it's a graph of a function? Well, what's the definition of a function? We're out of focus. I'm going to pause for a second so you can. Only one y value, each x value. Well, word here in the domain. Now we talked about domain last week, sometime two weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago today. I don't remember exactly what the day was. And it'll be up to you to kind of make notes of what's in the videos or what's done in class. So you kind of know where to look if you do need to look at things. Okay. That's the short way to understand the course and do well. Okay. Even though it takes a little longer to do that. It organizes your thinking, reinforces a lot of things, and helps you understand everything. So in the long run, you perform better for the number of hours you spend in the course. And you've got to spend some different hours in this course. Okay. So only one y value for each x value in the domain. What's the domain? As I graph this function, the domain is all the x values. So all the x values. What? I'm not going to do them all because there are a whole lot of them. I think there are many and take them up forever. Okay. Uh, if this point is included in the graph, this point is included in the graph, and this point is included in the domain, and so is this, and so is every other x value between them. So main is all these X values. And we got a question, so let's get that. Okay. It's true. But another way of stating this, and this is logical thinking, which you can learn in a math course that's not taught rotary. Okay? And we're not teaching rotary. A little rotate okay if you think about what it means down the road sometime. And if you put it together with other things, then you're learning something. Okay, there you go. Only one y value for each x value in the domain. I e means in s. Everybody knows Latin, right? So it means they're uh they're, they're okay. 
so it is, so it follows. I don't remember asking yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, my Latin dress. Um, that's about all I remember. Uh, only one y value for each x value in the domain, i.e., put it in plain English, ain't no x value. What has two or more y values, you put it in formal mathematical language. Okay. Now, eight no is a double negative, which is logically not what you are saying if you say ain't no. So I'm going to take the word ain't out of there. One reason that ain't is a word. People don't like to use because it gets misused, like what they know without understanding the logic of it. Okay, well, whether well, Thomas Jefferson mentioned the quadratic formula in the Declaration of Independence or not, this kind of logic is important outside of mathematics. Okay. No x value. What has well to be that has two or more y value. We don't try to go to the vernacular. No. Is this so? I'm saying there's no x value that has more than two or more y value. Can you show me an x value that has more than two y values? How about this? Okay, this is your x value. How many y values do you have on the curve? This one. Well, that's the only y value for that x. Okay. What if I turn this graph around so that it looks like this? Well, you still have the domain. You take every point on the graph and show its next value. And that includes the points up there. Now, the orange vertical lines kind of stop here. But that doesn't change the fact that uh, points up to here are in the domain because they're parts of the graph that have x value here. Okay, so here's the domain all the way from here to here. Now, all the way from here to here. And the orange part, whatever color this is, brownish red, I don't know. Two y values for each x between here and here. Right? So that if I want this to be my x, and we will use some kind of function color here. Um, and I've got a point here and a point here.
And this is a vertical line that passes through the graph in two points. Right? You have a vertical line. I'll say intersects the graph. So this graph does not represent a function. Now you got the vertical line test. And it's easy to use the vertical line test and forget about the logic behind the vertical line test. If you want to enlarge your brain a little bit, make some neural connections that are going to be beneficial to you, you're going to want to think about that. You might not have time, but that's how I would test the course. I would say, explain the vertical line test. Why does it work in terms of the definition of a function? Connect the definition of a function to the vertical line test. Write me a paragraph. Right? I might even put something like that on a test as an extra credit card. So, not saying I will, but uh, it's worth it just for your own general benefit to understand that logic. Okay. Um, well, that's a definition of a function. Now, every graph, every of our toolkit shapes forms a function, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Okay. But if I take the toolkit squaring shape, that's kind of, it's a little lopsided. That's kind of what the toolkit squaring shape could give you for this. Domain. Okay. I promised to mention range. I got that off the top. Get a little bit of that in a minute. But for this domain, um, that might be like the square function. Okay. Now, if I switch X and Y, flip it. Remember, two weeks ago we flipped the columns of the table. If you flip the columns, you get something that looks like this. The X's become Y's, the Y's become X's. So that actually ends up down you know, about here somewhere, not here. But it's going to look a lot like this. And it's not going to be a function anymore. That's going to be very important. Short. Okay. So I mentioned it now, and you want to think about it. Okay. I like to talk about range because then we get to talk about what one to one means. Okay. So the range. is the set of all y values. And here is a picture of the brain. I'm going to eventually connect that to some algebra. Okay, so Kind of get your courage up and be prepared to do that, whether we have to do it today or next time. A one to one function. have exactly one Y for every X. Okay. 
Uh, and I got the time for the start of the way. I'm not sure we exactly want to explain why. Uh, I think now this function, it's a function because there's exactly one y for every x. If I said only one y for every x, I could replace only one with exactly one. It could be only one or exactly one one. Here I use the word exactly. Okay. Well, pick a y. Here's a y. How many x's go with this y? Well, here's one. And here's one. Two x's with this y. And so here's a lot of values. But right, here's an X that goes with that Y value. We have two X values, and it looks like a two X and the right two think of the O X values for this one. Okay. And if a function, and we can say if f of x, whatever the formula for f of x happens to be, or the definition of f of x, if f of x is one to one, Then we can swap X and Y values. Get a new function, which we call F with a negative one up here, but it's not an exponent. And we read that as F inverse of X. Now you're going to have to kind of sort that out. I am not going to show you about it. Now. You got to work through the assignment with good understanding so you can understand this, okay? And you, you can do it, you just have to be sure you spend the time. Okay. Now there are other topics that I want to address and I kind of made myself a list so I don't forget anything. So I'm just going to kind of okay. Look at the more at the idea of domains. I've illustrated it with pictures. And if f of x is one over x minus five, substitute any x value except what and get a y value. Okay, we got the right answer. Any x value except five, you get a y value.
And we'll say y equals here. F of five, the you place x by five. You get one over five minus five, which is one over zero. Which is undefined. Now I'm going to quickly show you in terms of graphs that you know why this is undefined. Okay. Right here is the point five zero. Right here is a four by four rectangle. And when we construct our reciprocal shape within this rectangle. Okay. Here's our center line. Here's our vertical center line. And you can make it a little darker. And we know that our graph looks like this. This is the graph of y equals one over f minus five. This is the line and it's equals five. Every time we get twice as close to the y equals to the x equals five line, the y value doubles. That should be obvious if you understand the construction, because each of these lines is twice as close to the one before it. Okay. So if we continue to go twice as close, we would continue to go twice as and when I say twice as high. I mean, it can go twice as far from the x axis. From the uh, the horizontal center line, sorry. Okay. In other words, twice as close, twice as far over this bar. We go twice as close, now we're this far. We go twice as close, now we're this far. Now the domain of this, as I've graphed it, stops here, goes from here to here, and then it picks up from here to here. Nothing in between the two. But if I continue this process, as I've said before, we keep going twice as high as we go twice as close. And there's no limit. How close? How close to what? How close to the x equals five line? I leave that implicit. Okay. There's no limit to how far we get from the horizontal center line. So if we say that there's some number that's equal to f of phi, that means there's a point on this vertical center line. There'll be no point because we can never get to the vertical center line. 
Okay. And the closer we get, the more we keep going twice as far. It doesn't take many steps until we're out of the atmosphere. It doesn't take that many more before we get to the moon. It doesn't take all that many more before we get to the edge of the galaxy, which is way, way further than the moon. Okay? Less than 100 steps will get us just about anywhere in the universe. Okay? Well, I might be exaggerating a little bit there, but 200 steps, yeah. Okay. And of course, you understand all that if you understand logarithms, which you will by the end of the course if you do all Okay. So there we are. Uh, this is why we say that division by zero is undefined, not just because of this graph, because of any such graph or any such process. Okay. You get closer and closer to something, you're going to get bigger and bigger. And there's no limit to how close, so there's no limit to how big. That's real important. If you want to understand a little bit of calculus, it's real important if you want to understand things like we've been talking about, okay? Including some things that are of practical value, no matter what Thomas Jefferson left out of the Declaration of Independence, okay? Oh, I can't believe the morons are that. Okay, or the bad thinking. That's no more. That was the article I'm talking about. Um, it's making a, a terrible event for me. Um, misunderstanding what it means to learn mathematics. Okay. Yeah, the curriculum misunderstands it too. So it's got its points. Okay, well, enough of my raving. Um, the point there is. Might be hard to read that. All x values except zero. Okay. In interval notation, which I'm not going to explain to you because open map does a good job of that. But you want to be sure you understand it. You're going to ask me about it next time. Uh, and of course, you get interval notation in the introduction to open map. Um, I said all x values except zero for this function, it's all x values except five. So it's the open interval from negative infinity to five combined with, this is a union symbol, the open interval from five to infinity. The parenthesis as opposed to the bracket means that five isn't included here. And this open parenthesis means it's not included here, so it's not included. Well, that's what you have to understand about the domain. So one restriction on the domain is you're not allowed to have zero in the denominator. Okay? That's one rule that you look for. And there are only about two rules. I can't think of a third one right off, unless you go to piecewise functions and stuff. I'll let you read about. The denominator can't be zero. Okay. Another one is C. 
square root of a negative is forbidden. I'll just write this because I can't help myself. It just says to real values functions. If you go to complex values, you can do the square root of negative. You would well do some complex numbers. So if a function has real values, if y has to be a real number, you can't have the square root of the negative. And more restrictions. It's not the only two, but these would be two that you need to understand right off the bat. So What's the domain of the square root of x plus i? Well, x plus i can't be negative. Now, why can't you have a negative under the square root? Because the square root of a number is a number you multiply by itself to get that number. That's a lot of numbers, but uh, it means if you square the square root of a number, you should get that number. You can't get a negative number by squaring a number. If you square a negative number, you have a negative times a negative, which is positive. Okay? If you square a positive number, well, Square is positive. Okay. Square of any real number is positive, except of course the square of zero is zero, but that's okay. Square root of zero then is zero. Well, if x plus five can't be negative, that means it has to be at least zero or greater. The negative numbers are forbidden. Okay. So you conclude that X is greater than negative, greater than or equal to negative five. Now, pretty soon we'll see how to form the graph of the square root of x plus pi. We form the graph of the square root of x. It's a plain old square root of x function by switching the x and y values to the squaring function. That gives us a parabola on its side like the one we just saw. But that's not a function because there are two y's for every x. But if we print off the lower branch of the function, we're left with the upper branch, and that's the graph of the square root function. Okay? So it looks something like this. I'm going this to graphs in a way that will make it a little bit clearer when we get to the end of the chapter. So last section in the chapter is in instructions. We'll be getting to that late next week or maybe early or the early following. Okay, right there's a graph of, you know, you can think, okay, there's the square root function where you switch to x and y values. Now it's got a branch down here, but we don't include it. So we just kind of pop that out. Here's my square root. Well, then where is the square root of x plus five? Thank you. Come over here to minus pi, and we draw the same shape. Okay. 
and the square root of x plus 5 is the square root of x minus h, but h is negative 5. So this is just a graph over 5 units to the left. We've seen how that works and why it works by moving those 4 by 4 squares around. And we've verified why it works, which is the one thing I want you to understand. And you see that this function has a domain. And this keeps on going. The domain consists of all numbers greater than or equal to negative 5. And it includes negative 5. So this is the interval. You don't need the picture of the graph to know that this is the interval that goes along with this inequality. Now, a few of the problems are going to require a little more algebra than that. Like if this was 2x plus 5, what would change? Well, then you have 2x plus 5 greater than or equal to 0. Subtract 5 from both sides, you'd end up with 2x greater than or equal to negative 5. And divide both sides by two. You get a greater than equal two and a half. Okay. So the algebra, if the, if the function is linear in here, it's just simply you have the same thing on both sides, in fact, the same thing, multiply, divide. Okay. Just the basic rules of algebra that people incidentally often screwed up when we did the diagnostic. Okay. Don't screw it up. If you do, you're going to get the wrong answer, and maybe that'll make you honest. And we're trying to make honest people out of you. Not to make honest people. Don't make up honest people. And you don't act like these honest people. <laughs> okay? So, maintain your integrity. You <laughs> have learn the stuff. All right. Um, that one more time with that article I'm thinking on. I didn't read every word, but I read enough to understand the main thrust. And if I call a guy a fool, it's not really so very smart guy making an important point that doesn't understand what can be done with mathematics education. Okay. Um, now, there's other stuff I was going to go over today, but uh, maybe I've laid enough on you. Let me just take a look. <clears throat> 